No, 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 no. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. This this time, I I come as a f friend. Pass. Friend. All's well. What do you want? Interested in a little shoot off? Why? Oh, oh, I, yeah, hold on, wait, yeah, mm, I get it, sure, yeah, no end of a lesson, yeah, is that it? Sure, yeah, no, uh-uh, well, that is what it is, but uh, God and my Mauser here are just itching for a bit of a wager. Not interested, mm-mm, no, mm-mm, oh, come on now, it'll be fun. Nope. Come on. Nope. Oh, come on now. No. It'll be fun. No. Now, off you go, and I won't tell anybody you were here. I've got a bottle of whiskey up for grabs. The water of life? Yes. <laughs> well, uh, look, no, I, uh, no, no, I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, no. No. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. Okay, yes, I'll do it. But I'm not really interested in it. Look, do what your Queen Victoria does when she has to do something that she's not interested in. Lie back, close your eyes, and think of England. Hey, just leave her out of this, shall we? Hmm? Just between you and I. Okay, let's go. Come on, you're on. <laughs> I knew you'd say yes. Well, uh, that changed awfully quickly. We're definitely now not on the veld. No matter. <clears throat> on with the video. When the British Army sailed for South Africa in 1899, it had to its credit a recent history of significant success, culminating in the Battle of Omdurman in 1898. Flush with this confidence, it would soon have this shattered when it came up against the Boers. Advancing on multiple axes to relieve forces besieged by the Boers, the British were checked at every approach, often with bloody and unfortunate results. The Boers were a formidable foe and tactically adept. The British suffered from hugely significant tactical mistakes, often at the hands of commanding generals. While the army was in fact possessed of the skills needed to fight in South Africa, these, especially early on, were commonly not exercised due to oversight, underestimation of the enemy, and in some cases, simple hubris. It would take time and many hard lessons for the army to get its head in the game, as it were, and begin to use the tools inherent in its training to fight the fight appropriate for South Africa. While these tactical mistakes and omissions were mostly the cause of the poor performance on the early battlefields of the war, there was another issue that became apparent, musketry. The British Army of 1899 was armed with a combination of rifles, all belonging to the Lee family the Lee Metford, and the later Lee Enfield. While the technical differences between these two were essentially moot, there was one aspect in particular that proved to be troubling. The newer Lee Enfield rifles weren't shooting straight. While this technical fault was due to improper manufacture of the sights and was a whole issue unto itself, and indeed the earlier but commonly used Lee Metfords did not suffer from this fault, there was one other aspect that soon became apparent. The Boers had an advantage in the rifle they carried. The Mausers, purchased in the late 1890s by both Boer republics in both rifle and carbine versions, shot a 7mm cartridge that was modestly better than the British 303. The Boer rifle's true advantage was in its method of loading. The Lee Metfords and Lee Enfields had, for the most part, a useful 10-round magazine that was typically reserved for critical times on the battlefield, but otherwise were to be loaded singly. The Mauser rifle of the Boers loaded with this, a charger. Holding five rounds, the capacity of the magazine, 
The Charger enabled a high rate of fire and could sustain that over a long time if required. Matched with a general awareness and skill in musketry, this made the Boer, formed in his commando, a most formidable foe. Today, greatly overshadowed by the cataclysms that were the two world wars, the Second Anglo-Boer War was, at the time of its waging, the single greatest commitment of the British Army, ever, numbering some half-million men at its zenith. It was the last war of the Victorian age and the first of a new century. Now, this is not a study of the war in general, but rather a window into one peculiar aspect of the conflict that has long been repeated. The inferiority of the British Army's magazine Lee Metfords and Lee Enfields as compared to the Boer Mausers. For this, I've decided to use the channel's Firepower series, which typically pits two arms against one another in a simple rapid-fire test. Now, this subject has been covered in some detail before in a Firepower video featuring the channel's Mark I Magazine Lee Metford and the Mark III Star SMLE. Here, in this video, advantage has been taken to use the channel's Boer Mauser and the Mark I Star Magazine Lee Enfield to further develop the analysis. Even the most casual students of the Second Anglo-Boer War will have heard, oft repeated, of the Boers' ability to outshoot their opponents, and the hapless Tommies, with their completely outmatched Metfords and Enfields, unable to effectively fight back. The British Army was armed with a family of rifles during the conflict, nearly all being used, not in sequence, but rather concurrently. While an exhaustive study of the British Army is not the subject here, it might be advantageous to discuss exactly how the British Army was armed. From about 1890 onwards, the Army was re-equipped with the so-called magazine rifle, replacing the Martini Henry of earlier Victorian fame. There would be some six versions manufactured over the course of the next decade. What is important to realize is that each did not replace that which came before in any kind of wholesale way, with the exception to that being the very first mark. Far from it. Nearly all versions were used concurrently, at one point or another in South Africa. Here is a short recap. Issued from about 1890, the Mark I Magazine Lee Metford featured an eight-round magazine, Lewis pattern sights, which were technically okay but unconventional in function, in that they used a large front sight block with a slit cut down the center, and a large square notch in the backsight. Distinctive finger grooves in the forestock, a forward mounted sling, and a small cocking piece. The Lewis sights were unsatisfactory in service, and they were changed from 1892 onwards with the Mark I Star magazine Lee Metford. Nearly all of the Mark I's were modified to this new standard, which included barleycorn sights, and a disc let in to the butt on the right-hand side. That same year, the design was modified with the Mark II magazine Lee Metford. This rifle featured a lighter barrel, a slimmer stock profile without the finger grooves, a rear-mounted sling, the same small cocking piece, and importantly, a new double-stack magazine featuring a 10-round capacity. Rifles of the family to date had no safety catch, and in 1895, the Mark II Star Magazine Lee Metford was introduced, which featured a safety catch mounted on an extended cocking piece. Importantly, only some 3,000 were made before the next major change was introduced. It had been discovered that the ammunition with cordite propellant introduced from 1891 eroded the shallow polygonal Metford rifling somewhat prematurely so a more conventional type was selected to replace it. From 1895, the Mark I Magazine Lee Enfield, outwardly identical to the previous Mark II Star Lee Metford, would be manufactured with the conventional Enfield rifling. In May of 1899, the abolition of clearing rods occurred. Thereafter, they would be turned in, and rifles, the Mark I Star Magazine Lee Enfields, would be made without the provision for the rods to be fitted, with no channel or hole in the end of the bayonet lug. Now even this is not an exhaustive look at all the changes that took place from mark to mark. 
but rather the salient cosmetic details have been alluded to here to better enable, when looking at photographs, to ascertain the fact that these rifles were used concurrently during the war in South Africa. All rifles used cordite ammunition, which featured a 215 grain, round-nosed and jacketed projectile, which traveled at around 2,000 feet per second. Now it's true that the Metford rifling and the earlier rifles did not stand up well to this cordite ammunition, but it would be completely erroneous to believe that each newer version of the rifle replaced wholesale the previous version on a given date and year. All rifles, regardless of mark, were simply used until they were worn out, thereafter being repaired if possible. To put things in perspective, the barrel life of a Lee Metford was in the neighborhood of between five and 6,000 rounds. Now, this is not a large number, but placed in the context of annual use of somewhere around 200 rounds by the average soldier during his annual qualification, the rifles would at least last for a number of years, excessive use on active service notwithstanding. The Boer military system was of course very different from that of Britain. The two are Boer republics, the Transvaal, and the Orange Free State held only very small regular military forces, namely their artillery arm, and the remainder of their so-called military strength lay in their citizenry. It was expected in times of need that citizens would leave their farms, homes, and places of employment and assemble in territorial-based commandos, arriving with their personal necessities and weapons. Organization was established and chains of command were decided on. Commandos could range far and wide, but interestingly were voluntary in membership. There was no conscription or compulsion to serve, but rather it was simply the Boer way. Weapons used by the Boers were imported into the country by the government to then be sold on to individual burghers. This system of personally owned arms had been in place for a very long time, and again was hand in hand with Boer culture. By the late 1890s, and after many solicitations by arms manufacturers, the Boer republics of the Transvaal and the Orange Free State selected the Mauser rifle to standardize on. This was the acme of mid-1890s technology, and the weapons arrived in various forms, standard length rifles, carbines, and indeed some sporting versions. Chambered in the relatively new 7mm cartridge, this marked a departure from the older black powder 45 caliber rifles that many Boers were familiar with. Along with the millions of rounds of ammunition, their Mauser rifles formed the main armament of the Boer commandos, especially in the early part of the war, before wastage and capture forced the increased use of captured British weapons. While it might be expected that the regular Boer artillery arm had some sort of musketry program, the vast majority of the commandos would rely on the fact that their members showing up knew how to shoot. This would have been taken for granted as rifle shooting was fully ingrained in Boer culture and society. Hunting, protection and sport were the chief outlets for the use of the Burgers Mauser. Recreational shooting was extremely popular with teams and competitions proliferating across the countries. The rifles used for this video are comparative newcomers to the channel. The Mark I Star Magazine Lee Enfield is representative of all the marks of rifle, with the exception of the Mark I Lee Metford, its 10-round magazine being chief among its salient features. Made by BSA, it has markings showing South Africa service, this of course referring to the Union of South Africa post-1910. The features of this mark are present, the safety mounted on the cocking piece, the barticorn sights, the long range or dial sights graduated to 2,800 yards, and the lack of a provision for the clearing rod with no hole in the bayonet lug or channel cut into the stock. Its 10 round magazine has the requisite cutoff for single loading and magazine fire, very much in keeping with the doctrine of the era. The channel's 1895 Boer Mauser is a somewhat unconventional example in that it has a turned down bolt handle, a comparatively rare feature. Marked to the Orange Free State, it exemplifies the features of this style of Mauser.
the charger guide built into the body, and the internal five-round double-stack magazine. It has the usual backsight, graduated in meters. It represents the acme of the military service rifle of the mid to late 1890s, its charger loading and its 7mm caliber being seen as perhaps its best qualities. The ammunition used for this video was a combination of my usual cast hand loads, which approximate the Mark 1 to 6 303 round, and feature a 210 grain bullet traveling at just under 2,000 feet per second, as well as commercially available Federal 7mm Mauser, which features a 175 grain bullet at a velocity of 2,300 feet per second. These are loaded into a series of Swedish Mauser chargers, and thence into the homemade bandolier. Not perhaps the most economical type of ammunition, but it's the only version commercially available that replicates the historical round nose version as used during the Boer War. Many thanks to the patrons of the channel who helped in this regard. The targetry used for all practices was a Great War Vintage number two figure, which has become the standard for the Firepower series. As usual, it was set at 100 yards. Now, as I thought about the practice, I'd have to shoot a series of rounds that would demonstrate what I thought would be the advantage of the Mauser's charger loading. After all, firing 10 or fewer rounds would be an obvious advantage to the Lee Enfield with its large 10 round magazine. I settled on 15 rounds, as surely the time it would take to refill the magazine with five individual rounds from the pouch with the Lee Enfield would surely demonstrate the Mauser's speed in reloading. The Mauser was up first. The practice went smoothly enough. The throw of the bolt is noticeably longer on the Mauser, and while it's not excessive, I did remark on the increased movement I had to undertake. The reload from the bandolier was relatively effortless, and the five rounds went into the magazine incredibly smoothly, without issue. The sights were easily picked up, and aiming was repeatable and straightforward. So, 15 rounds rapid with the Boer Mauser. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Uh, not a bad group, just a little bit on the high side. Uh, my point of aim was about here. That's the way it goes sometimes with old military rifles. I was happy enough with the group, although I nearly missed with that high one. The Mauser turned in a time of 58 seconds. So, with a quick change of hat, the Lee Enfield was up next. Now here, I was confident that the first 10 rounds would definitely be faster, as there would be no requirement to reload. The rifle chugged along with the usual Lee smoothness. In firing right after the Mauser, I couldn't help but remark on the advantage felt with what was very noticeably a smoother action. As it came time for the five round reload from the pouch, I was also confident that the time spent in faffing around with the single rounds would mitigate any advantage and put me behind. So that was 15 rounds rapid, or as rapid as you can get, with the uh, Mark I Star Magazine Lanfield. Let's count them up here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, oh, fifteen. <laughs> we'll ask you what happened with that one. But it's on target. The group was horrible. But as mentioned, they were all there.
Just how surprised do you think I was to find that the Lee Enfield clocked a time of 53 seconds? Five seconds better than the Mauser. All in all, it was a fun comparison, and a five second difference really isn't that much. But the fact that the difference was in favor of the Enfield really made my head shake a bit. Why wasn't the Mauser faster? I decided to compare things head to head. Things start out okay, but within the first five rounds, the clunkier bolt and maybe my slightly less familiarity with the rifle has already put me behind with the Mauser. The first 10 rounds ends for the Enfield as the Mauser puts the sixth downrange. Obviously, the Mauser made up a good deal of time as the Enfield was reloading. And the two are nearly neck and neck as the 11th round is fired. But like a steady advance, the Enfield pulls away in the last five rounds to its five second lead. Clearly, what was needed was a bit of a step up to better compare the two rifles. So, find some rustic clothing to go with that bandolier, get the mustache in order, and settle down for an increase to a 20 round practice. By firing 20 rounds, surely the increased loading time of the Lee Enfield must put it at a disadvantage. Would the time it took to reload 10 rounds from the pouch instead of only 5 be longer than the two reloads and somewhat clunkier action of the Mauser? I suppose I'd find out. I made the effort to put more attention in working the bolt, and I felt as though the rifle cycled better as a result. The first reload had a bit of a hiccup in that one round fell off the charger. It wasn't a big deal and things got back on track very quickly. I had a little problem in finding the last charger, although I had opened the pockets beforehand. Dealing with them individually would have skewed the results disproportionately. Well, there we are. Shooting a little high, but they're all there. The group was decent enough, although a little bit high again. The time was one minute, 14 seconds, or call it 74. It was make or break time for the Lee Enfield. In the spirit of the reshoot and British muzzleloaders in general, on went the Karki Drill, Slade Wallace, and Kiltaper. Surely that would make for better shooting, right? As expected, things began well enough. There were a couple of delays as an elongated case or two found its way into the mix, which made for difficult chambering. But all in all, the first ten rounds went down range smoothly. Then it was time for the reload. I can say in having done it, that 10 rounds from the pouch seems like an eternity, even doing them two at a time. The rounds are held in a series of leather loops and they can become somewhat tightly held, requiring a bit of effort to pull them free. Incidentally, this style of pouch with its forward opening flap, which was designed to increase the security of the ammunition inside, certainly does its job.
and gets in the way. They being reproduction poachers notwithstanding. Beginning the second ten rounds, there was an awful lot of time to make up. For some reason, my left elbow began to float. Perhaps it was the butt sliding down on the leather brace at my shoulder. It didn't seem to bother much, if indeed it was sloppy drills. There was one more sticky case, and then it was over. Well, there we have it. 20 rounds with the Lee Enfield. Let's count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. So, they're all on target. I'm very interested to see how it stacks up against the Mauser. The grouping this time was much better than the first, both in size and in placement. I had to get home to review the footage, and after that, Lee Enfield turned in a time of 1 minute 31, or 91 seconds. I decided on a third practice. This would consist of a dash to cover, a loading of five rounds, and firing. This time, however, the Enfield would single load. The Mauser turned in a time of 27 seconds. Now, with single loading, I knew that the Enfield most assuredly would be slower. The Enfield was nearly 50% slower, with a time of 43 seconds. So, by this point, there had been three practices shot with each rifle. And I suppose it was a bit of an afterthought to include a simple grouping practice for further context. It would be simple enough. Ten rounds with each rifle, at 100 yards. As this was a grouping practice intended to show the relative strengths of each rifle, I elected to use the prone supporting position. So, oh, 10 rounds with the Mauser. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Uh, I'll plug that into the figure of merit calculator and we'll arrive at a figure of merit. The height of the group notwithstanding, I was expecting for somewhat better results in that I was taking my time and doing my best. Perhaps an inherent show of what the rifle is capable of. I elected to use the magazine for the Lee Enfield for no other reason other than to make the grouping go smoothly and efficiently. So there we are, the 10 rounds with the Lee Enfield. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. All there. Again, let's plug that into the figure of merit calculator. The grouping was decent enough, 
and seemed to be on par with that of the Mauser. Of course, the figure of merit calculator would show the clarity needed in this comparison. There it was, a figure of merit of 2.18 inches for the Mauser and a figure of merit of 2.11 inches for the Lee Enfield. The group sizes for both hovered around the 7 inch mark. Considering that the factory ammunition is, well, just that, and I'm not unable to tinker with the parameters of the loading, and I've done no workup in relation to my cast loads with the Lee Enfield, the results generally would speak for themselves. So, after four practices and 50 rounds, each had come out on top twice. What did this all mean? Were the time differences really that much of an issue? Did this mean that the stories of battlefield superiority were true or false or maybe just erroneous and clouded in misinterpretation or perhaps made out of context? There would have to be more thought put towards it. This really set my mind thinking and I decided to perhaps examine the subject further with the following categories. Trajectory and velocity, effective range, musketry and fire tactics, rapid fire, and Lee Enfield sighting issues. Maybe somewhere within these five topics, a better, more clear answer would develop, because in the shooting thus far, the expected results had not materialized to the degree I was anticipating. First up was trajectory and velocity. Historically, the ammunition used in the Lee series of rifles during the Boer War and for nearly all of their service life was the Mark II 303 cartridge, as the various forms of soft point and hollow point ammunition that had entered service in the late 1890s, the Mark II Special, 3, 4, and 5 had been outlawed under international law. The Mark II cartridge was hastily readopted. Most of this is moot, as their velocity and trajectory were of the same specification. This was 2,000 feet per second using a 215 grain fully jacketed round-nose bullet. The Mauser used a similar bullet, although of lighter weight. 175 grains, round-nosed as well, it was pushed at 2300 feet per second. So, obviously, the Mauser's round was what we might say ballistically superior to the 303. But two questions arose. By how much? And to what effect? Velocity's chief impact on the battlefield, if we can take penetration out of the discussion, as the human body is horribly fragile regardless of a projectile, is its effect on trajectory. It's generally taken that a flatter trajectory is more desirable than an arced example. And as this diagram shows, the Mauser's was marginally flatter than the 303. Now, why is flatter better? It doesn't make the rifle inherently more accurate in the sense of tighter groups, but what it does afford is a larger point-blank range. This is the range that the rifle can shoot along which the bullet will not carry above the height of its target. Now, this is open to all sorts of interpretation, but generally, especially in this era, that range was calculated with a prone firer and a standing enemy, with the point of aim being at the feet. This gives a point-blank range for the Lee Metford and Lee Enfields, somewhere around 525 yards, and the Mauser at somewhere around 600. Is this difference actually a factor on the battlefield? I might argue theoretically yes, but operationally, with all the variables of terrain, visibility, stress, and the like, very little. So in conclusion, I might move that the battlefield effect of the Mauser's modest velocity advantage is marginal. One small caveat exists here, and that is to say, that later generations of 7mm Mauser ammunition were indeed much, much faster, in the neighborhood of 2700 feet per second, using a lighter Spitzer bullet. Perhaps the common knowledge of these later types of cartridges has bled back in time and tainted our perception of the reality of the 7mm cartridge at the time of the Boer War. Next is effective range. Effective range is one of those off-quoted but eminently fuzzy parameters that is used a great deal with regards to musketry discussions. It sounds good when read off the paper, but just what does it mean? The range at which one can be guaranteed of reasonable odds of hitting your target? What is your target? A single man? 
A group? What about the heads of a group of enemy looking over a trench parapet? Is effective range a gauge of a single firer or a group of firers? The answers are as endless as the parameters of the question. The Boer War provides an interesting filter to examine this aspect. The war was well known for its engagement ranges. Indeed, this aspect had an incredible effect on British military thinking in the post-war era. Clear air, wide open spaces, great tracts of unforested and unpopulated country, all made for situations where musketry could be brought to bear at ranges that became legendary. Too often, this is viewed through the wrong lens. These long-range engagements are filtered through the context of a singular marksman shooting at a singular enemy. This, of course, is completely inappropriate. Importantly, long-range fire in this era was the preserve of groups fighting against groups. Long-range fire was not unknown to the British Army. Indeed, rifle fire had been delivered at 2,000 yards at the Battle of Omdurman with effect. So how does the Mauser-Lee-Enfield debate manifest itself accurately as it pertains to effective range? Very clearly, rifles of the era could deliver fire at vast ranges. The Boer War is flush with accounts and anecdotes of Boer rifle fire routinely delivered at similar ranges. Often, it is stated that the Mauser outranged the haplessly Metford or Lee Enfield of the British. The supposition is that the Boers could shoot at ranges that the British could not. Patently, this is false. Either rifle could shoot far beyond the range at which an individual target could be identified, sighted at, and hit with any degree of certainty. However, when fired collectively at groupings of enemy, or at natural or man-made features containing enemy numbers, the massed effect of rifle fire, well-directed and supervised, would tell. So the conclusion here is that some sort of effective range superiority of the Mauser is not substantiated by the technical ability of the rifles in question. A caveat may exist here in the subject of the cavalry carbine. Although they were sighted to 2,000 yards, the greatly reduced velocity due to the shorter barrel meant that its trajectory would have been much more rainbow-like than the rifle, and therefore long-range fire would have been that much more difficult to render effective. The next aspect to consider is that of training. Were the Boers better trained in fire tactics than the British who opposed them? I think that a case can certainly be made here, although one cannot use the term training accurately here when talking of the Boers. The Boers were generally a citizen force, with the exception of their artillery arm, which was regular. Their training was more of a cultural norm than any kind of program or course. Well known was the fact that Boer culture was intertwined with weapons for defense, for hunting, and for sport. It must be said, however, that although Boer field forces were temporary and formed directly from the citizenry, there was still a military system at play. Military service in the commando was expected and required, and the rifles that they carried were ultimately provided by the government for private purchase by the individual burger. The end result was a body of men who were well armed with the most up-to-date Mauser rifle. They generally were very familiar with it as far as its capabilities and handling, and had much opportunity to practice with it, either on the veldt, hunting game, or while engaged in shooting competitions. What resulted was a way of fighting that grew organically from the veldt, per se, with emphasis on individual skill and an outlook on collective fire that maintained flexibility and timeliness. The British Army, of course, came by its training by way of what it was, an army. It needed a system to take men completely unfamiliar with weapons and bring them to a level where they could fight. Musketry training was a product of the era and an evolution of what had come before. Musketry was a subject that was integral to the British regular army. The annual course was broken down into two parts, deliberate individual firing which featured conventional seven-round practices from 200 to 800 yards, shot at three different sizes of targets, and a second part, which was collective in nature, and was a mix of independent and volley firing in close and extended order at slow or deliberate and rapid rates of fire, the latter with the use of the magazine. These practices were augmented 
by practices in live fire attacks with troops advancing from 800 down to 200 yards. In addition, competitions, apart from routine training, were very popular. There was an emphasis on control, which usually manifested itself in the delivery of volley fire, usually by individual sections, whether in close or extended order. This technique was not without historical and successful precedent. Indeed, volley fire had carried the day in countless engagements, both in antiquity as well as contemporary to the late 1890s. However, firing on command proved not to be as successful against an enemy who was hidden and camouflaged and often only appeared in fleeting moments. There are many, many references to traditional fire tactics used by the British not being effective against Boers using a more organic system of musketry, enabling targets to be chosen and firing to be done on a more individual level. Now this does not mean that every Boer was out on the veldt doing his own thing. They were still a military of a certain nature and their chain of command was still responsible for orders and actions on the battlefield. Fire orders would have been given, acknowledged and obeyed as in every military. The more individual nature of the actual firing versus the controlled nature of the British perhaps could be seen as a more effective technique. An important caveat must exist here. Too often, these aspects of musketry on both sides are taken at face value and applied to the entire war. I believe this has a role to play in the questions and myths surrounding musketry in particular. Very clearly, the British prevailed in both phases of the war, the conventional and the guerrilla, and this must have occurred in either spite of inefficient musketry or because changes were implemented during the war. So often, the battles of Black Week or other high-profile defeats such as Spionkop taint the perception the way the war was waged. If one merely focuses on these battles to give an overall picture of how the war progressed, then indeed, how was it won at all? What follows is an account from the book entitled A Peep Over the Barleycorn, which is written under a pen name, Jack the Sniper, and showcases the actions of the 2nd Battalion, the West Yorkshire Regiment, during the initial phases of the campaign. This passage paints a vivid picture of the ineffectiveness of highly controlled musketry against an enemy such as the Boer. At the initiation of the fight, we replied with the customary section volleys to the Boer's independent rifle work. Acting under the orthodox battlefield regulations, senior sergeants stood in the rear uttering commands and were supported by other non-commissioned officers walking about superintending elevation and etc. This theoretical routine ran smoothly while the opposing fire held high, but as the enemy's aim improved and showers of boar manna fell thick upon the hillside, Joubert's blessings were received with bent back and bowed head by the sergeants and other non-commissioned officers. On looking rearward to discover the whereabouts of the silent-tongued sergeants when the firing became hot, I espied one or two peeping from behind immense boulders. Yes, when the kneeling-down attitude was of no avail, and an enemy using modern firearms had wrung the death knell of the ready-present-and-fire hubbub, they disappeared to bury themselves and the blathering volley behind the head cover of the Lee Metford manipulators. Our first lessons learned in the greatest of all schools of musketry were the impossibility of firing volleys under modern conditions. The great difficulty of locating an enemy using smokeless powder and the lunacy of remaining erect in the firing line. The words of command were preliminary. Volley firing, ready at the enemy in front, present, fire, etc. Orders automatically repeated as if the sergeants were conjurers using dummy soldiers in a display of trick rifle work on the hill. To carry out this practice of non-commissioned officers standing in rear uttering the words of command, noting the correctness of each man's sighting, and whether the volleys went short or over, the object of attack. I have already described for you the tolling of the above system's death knell. The come to heaven Tommy music, which blew the stenorian voiced sergeants out of the firing line, and the go to blazes Tommy music of which rent Sandhurst's theoretical balloon asunder, with a long tom shell. Apart from the impossibility of the volley in modern warfare, men get very cranky while waiting at the present for the command to fire. <laughs>
always believing that, that the lengthy period between both orders enables the enemy to enjoy a siesta after getting in some bone-breaking shots. During this mute and exasperating interval, soldiers are apt to curse, to get shaky, to get cranky, and pull off. Yes, let go, when the rifle is bobbing like the tender tail stump of a freshly docked horse. The latter means, of course, the blazing at the hole into which the rabbit has vanished, yet volleys under certain conditions, such as firing from cover against Zulus, or etc., are much more effective than independent trigger pulling. We felt much easier firing independently than under the strain waiting for the command fire in volleying rifle work. We were much handicapped in locating the position of the enemy, for the Boers take cover in a manner never to be equaled by even England's Lady Yeomanry, Baden-Powell's Boy Scouts, or an Irish policeman waiting to pounce on lads whistling the peeler and the goat. We sprayed every nook, crevice, donga, and spruit on and surrounding the Boer position with lead as if from a watering can, rocks being splintered two miles in the copy's rear. As mentioned, it's stories like these that are focused on and paint an incomplete picture of how the British army ultimately prevailed. Indeed, from the same volume, evidence of less controlled musketry. Particular reference here to the latter part of the paragraph, reading, crash, crash, go the volleys, and bang, bang, the independent firing of our battle line. So here, even at this early date, there has been some surrender of control as the men independently engage their enemy. For British troops, there also exists a narrative that they couldn't shoot or that they had very little musketry training, even extending to anecdotes of never firing their weapon until they reached South Africa. This needs to have the proper context put to it. British regular soldiers who were in South Africa at the beginning of the war and those who came from the United Kingdom and around the Empire were highly trained in musketry. As a recruit, some 189 rounds were fired in the course of their musketry training. This total dropped to 119 as trained men, but a large part of the difference was made up in the firing of other practices, such as field firing or individual shooting. The annual musketry course consisted of individual fire out to 800 yards, and an array of collective practices utilizing the tactical formations of the era. Close order, front rank kneeling type practices, but importantly, also conducted in extended order as they would characteristically fight in this era. Firing in these collective practices was by volley and independent firing, done both deliberately and rapidly. Supplementary to these were a series of practices including rapid individual firing, to the tune of seven rounds a minute, firing at moving targets, vanishing or surprise targets using five second exposures, running targets whereby the man would fire and advance at the double alternately in 100 yard increments. Where facilities existed, long range volleys could be conducted between 800 and 1500 yards. Admittedly, facilities for such practices must have been relatively scarce. Importantly, nuance is introduced as regards to training when we look at the many thousands of volunteers, yeomanry, and the, for hostilities only, imperial yeomanry. Many of these men, particularly those of the imperial yeomanry, did indeed arrive in South Africa poorly trained as a function of their rapid raising in the United Kingdom and subsequent deployment to South Africa. My feelings are that these anecdotal accounts of deficient training tend to bleed into the greater narrative of the army's performance. It's important to note, however, that the Boers were not supermen, and not all of them were necessarily marksmen of superior quality. Here, an excerpt from an account of a minor action, including a troop of mounted infantry protecting a troop train as it pushed across the veldt. As the troop approached a small hill, fire was opened upon them. We were about 250 yards from it when all of a sudden a hot fire was opened up on us by 70 or 80 Boers. I did not wait long to see, you bet. They were firing with Mauser magazine rifles. As we could do no more good, it not being possible to get at them, I gave the order to wheel about and gallop back. The air was simply alive with bullets. I should think that about a thousand rounds must have been fired at us. 
but so bad was their shooting that no one was even touched, except one horse which was wounded in the near hind leg. It was a very lucky escape, and the bullets were hitting the ground all around us. As a follow-on to the musketry aspect, the subject of rapid fire deserves attention. As is often the case, the Boers' superiority in fire over the British is linked keenly to the inherent qualities of the Mauser and its charger loading. As is proven to be the case here in these experiments, for short bursts of rapid fire, the Lee Metford or Lee Enfield can hold its own against the Mauser. Now, over a sustained period, however, the Mauser obviously prevails. I suppose that there might be some necessary context put to this relationship. Just how long did rapid fire last for? A minute? Two? Five? As long as there were targets to shoot at? How long would targets be visible for? All interesting questions. Rapid fire, as we might expect it, is a relatively close-range undertaking, say within the aforementioned point-blank range. But it could be said to be only really effective at even closer ranges, say 300 yards, where the balance is tipped between the time it takes to cycle the action and the time it takes to aim carefully enough to hit your target. The longer the range, the more time is needed to aim, and as the range increases, the rapidity in cycling the bolt becomes increasingly moot. Fire must be effective to influence your enemy, and truly rapid fire at longer ranges cannot be so, as the time needed for the extra careful aiming at long range is not inherently afforded. So given an appropriate range for rapid fire and the effectiveness of it, we might expect an advancing enemy to be stopped by it. How long might that take? Well, if an advancing enemy takes casualties at a high rate, the time needed in rapid fire might only be 30 seconds, or maybe a minute, before they seek cover. Perhaps much less. They then either become smaller targets, as though they were lying in the prone position, or perhaps disappear altogether behind whatever cover or concealment exists. In that case, a burst of 15 rounds or so might be all that is needed, thereby resorting to snap shooting as your enemy tries to get up and continue the advance. The fighting at Magers Fontaine is a good example of this. The Highland Brigade was sent to ground in their close order formation very quickly, but it remains that most of their casualties occurred during those initial moments, and perhaps more telling, when they tried to withdraw. The Boers simply didn't blaze away once their targets disappeared in the grass, searching instead for isolated targets as they appeared for the remainder of the day. It is not perhaps without a bit of irony that the Boer position at the bottom of the hill provided the most effective way to engage the British initially, but perhaps a higher position would have been much more valuable laterally, as they then could see the trapped British as they lay on the ground. So how does this relate to the experience and practices in the video? Both rifles are capable of 15 rounds a minute for at least one minute. And beyond that, the charger-loading Mauser invariably gains ground. We must also face the fact that magazine fire was not the default or even relied on technique in British service. Single loading of the Metford or Enfield was the doctrine of the day and it is perhaps the aspect that must be taken into consideration when comparing volume and rapidity of fire between the two rifles. The final aspect of the examination of musketry of the Boer War is the trouble experienced with the sights of specifically the Lee Enfield. The sights of the Lee Metford were offset to address bullet drift at longer ranges, and the same principle was applied to the manufacture of barrels with Enfield rifling. It was thought that a greater offset was required although the specific mathematics of this phenomenon are unknown to me at this time. What resulted was manufacture of barrels with sights that were overcompensated for this phenomenon. It was identified in 1900 as being a problem. As you might expect, instant action was taken. A committee was struck, known as the Small Arms Committee, and they immediately launched into an investigation to figure out what was wrong. In fact, this incorrect sighting of Lee Enfield rifles was the very first point considered in the agenda. This committee would go on to a myriad of other subjects, short rifles, chargers, the 276 Enfield cartridge, and the P-13 to name a few. But in 1900, their attention was firmly fixed 
on remedying the sighting of service rifles. Through much deliberation, the committee arrived at three courses of action. One was to continue to manufacture the barrels, but with correctly adjusted sights. The second, for rifles returning to store for repair, was to grind off the front sight and replace it with a dovetailed replacement adjusted correctly. The third option was for rifles in the field and entailed the installation of a new offset back sight. It is this third solution that I have installed on my Mark I Magazine Lee Metford with its Enfield barrel. I suspect that this aspect has crept in to the popular conception of Boer musketry superiority and the so-called ineffectiveness of British musketry. Incidentally, the relative late date of action taken to remedy this fault lends credence to the reality that the Lee Enfield versus the Lee Metford wasn't issued until the very eve of the Boer War, despite its acceptance for service in 1895. So far, from a simple rapid-fire test, this project has morphed into a greater examination on the subject of musketry during the Boer War. What has come of it? There is no doubt that Boer musketry left an indelible mark on the British Army. Indeed, it would form the genesis of the comprehensive reforms undertaken in the post-war era, which would culminate in the 1909 musketry regulations and the fine-tuning of British Army musketry just in time for the Great War. By simply stating broad brush concepts like Mauser good and Lienfield bad, or that the Boers could simply outshoot the British without examining why, we do not sufficiently put into context the fact that in the end, both in the early so-called conventional phase of the war and the later guerrilla phase, the British prevailed. Was the Mauser able to outrange the Lee Enfields and Lee Metfords? No. Both rifles could shoot to over 2,000 yards and achieve the desired effect. Was the Mauser more accurate? Well, not as far as figure of merit is concerned. Were the Boers better trained in marksmanship? Certainly, anecdotally, their style of musketry proved itself much more suitable or appropriate for the fighting in South Africa. Reliance on what I've termed a more organic delivery of fire would seem to be the chief aspect among their many strengths. British musketry was the product of 19th century operations. It was, at least going into the war, reliant on tight control, which was fine as long as the incoming fire did not disrupt the spotting of the enemy, the passage of commands, or the cohesion of a given fire unit. Once Boer fire began to tell, the fabric of command, one of the pillars that British musketry was built on, began to degrade, British fire could become wanting and ineffective. It should not, however, be assessed in a vacuum. Once the bloody noses and costly defeats were digested, solutions to the Boer way of fighting were sought and found, and this included better musketry practices. As to rapid fire, anecdotally, this appears to have weighed greatly upon the British soldier, many of whom had never been in action. It should be assessed in the context of well-delivered fire rather than all-out speed shooting, as that skill has a somewhat limited preserve, especially at the extended ranges often found on South African battlefields. Perhaps a better way to discuss Boer fire superiority is in the context of well-placed, dug-in and camouflaged defensive positions, with generally wide, long, open fields of fire and an enemy that has to cross that ground in order to come to grips. As the fighting in the major set-piece battles involved these exact scenarios, one might argue that it was the circumstances in which Boer musketry was delivered, rather than purely a matter of technical and personal ability, which made it stand out and leave its indelible mark upon the British Army. When we look at some of the great defeats of Black Week and other actions, and suppose that if the roles were reversed, would the British have held off the Boers at Colenso or Magers Fontaine? Would their Mausers have carried the day against a well-dug-in and determined British enemy? I might suppose not. It's been a very long discussion, but perhaps a short historical note might be in order. The British Army went to South Africa dressed for the first time in a universal khaki uniform. This applied to Highland troops as well. Traditionally, going into action wearing their kilts and hairsporns, as they had done just one year previous in the Sudan, for South Africa, they were issued with a khaki apron to cover the front of the kilt. This was applied to all Highland battalions and remained a feature of Highland troops in the field for the remainder of the war. Once the static nature of the guerrilla phase of the war began 
and garrisons of the many blockhouse lines settled down to their tedium, aprons could be dispensed with, and that traditional trapping of kilted service returned to wear. Troops campaigning on the veldt became increasingly adapted to life in the open. Bush hats and alternate methods of carrying their kit, not to mention the introduction of serge frocks, transformed the smart, uniformed Tommy or Jock of the early war into a comfortable and somewhat relaxed version that in some cases gives an enlightening window into the late Victorian army. While it was not the intent here to focus on kit, when the opportunity arose, it was to emulate the dress of a Highland soldier in the early years of the war. The khaki cover on the Foreign Service helmet, the aforementioned kilt apron, and the haversack worn on the back. This last aspect was widely practiced when other items did not preclude it, and found the haversack, normally slung at the left hip, transformed into a sort of small rucksack. Perhaps the one item that rose to its ascendancy during the war was the felt bush hat. Worn universally by the Boers, it became near universal in British service during the war, replacing the Foreign Service helmet in all but the most formal occasions. Hey! Hey! Give me that back! Borrowing from their adversaries, Post-war, the bush hat became the official field headdress of the British Army at home, as the army underwent significant cultural change in dress and tactics. Certainly a case of imitation being the best form of flattery. But perhaps the most significant change to come out of the Boer War, apart from the British Army's newfound tactical acumen, was the eventual adoption of the short magazine Lee Enfield, being universal to the infantry, cavalry, and artillery, and combining the best aspects of the magazine Lee Enfield and the Mauser in their 10-round magazine and charger loading, it was to be the backbone of Army small arms in the Great War and for the first half of the Second World War, until gradually replaced by its cousin, the number four, from 1943. For the Boers, apart from their regular artillery arm, there was no uniform and civilian clothes contemporary to the era were worn with the ubiquitous felt hat. Ammunition was carried invariably in some form of bandolier, either leather or sometimes made in a less costly canvas version. I made my bandolier with local materials. I must pass along thanks to friend of the channel, Henry, a stalwart member of the British Military Forum. It was he who saw fit to give me the opportunity to bring the Mauser into the fold, and without him, this project would not have happened. Truly a worthy addition to the British muzzleloader's collection. As well to Guy and Leonard West, who were gracious enough to allow the publication in the video of some of their drawings. They conduct their fair share of shooting of antique arms on their YouTube channel and enrich the historical arms community with their fantastic artwork. They've published numerous books filled with their art, which include incredible detail on the arms and ammunition. Subjects such as the Dreisa and the Shaspo, among many others, have been covered to date. They're available through Woodfield Publishing. Link in the description below. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. And for more information on projects, and updates between videos, follow us on our Facebook page.